Hey there. I'm really excited to bring you this interview with composer Paul Leonard Morgan about his work creating the music for the current version of Test Track. It's a good one. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me here on episode 45 of the Tomorrow Society podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton. Now, when we think about theme park attractions, it's easy to look just on the surface with the Imagineers, particularly with older attractions, but even with newer ones. We're thinking in terms of the leaders at Disney and the few names that are running the show. And all those people are very important. However, There are so many others that were involved in every attraction or even attraction updates that have happened at Disney World and the other Disney parks. Even when you just think in terms of the music, there's a few big names that a lot of us think of, like Bruce Broughton, for example, that are involved in a lot of attractions. But there are other names that aren't as familiar, but are equally talented and played a huge role in making the parks what they are today. And that's why I was really excited to get to talk to Paul Leonard Morgan, who's a composer from Glasgow, Scotland, who originally became known through his scores for the films Limitless with Bradley Cooper and Dread, which that movie is an incredible update. And not Judge Dread. I'm talking about the film Dread with Carl Urban that is a visceral experience and the score plays a huge role. In making that film work, I recently rewatched it and was stunned by how much the music accomplishes without being noticed. And so given the fact that he'd done so well at scores for those sci-fi movies, it made sense that Paul would be brought in by Disney to work on the score when they were updating Test Track in 2012. That's largely the focus of my conversation with Paul, is what was involved with putting together that score for Test Track, which, again, is a really important part of what makes the attraction work, which now it's more focused on the future with the way it looks, and especially with the music from the more type of mechanical score that they had in the past, which was more about almost sounded like you were going through an assembly line where this one is a lot more about looking to the future and I think fits really well with the theme of Epcot Center. Paul does a really nice job in this interview, I think, of talking us through the challenges to create a score for an attraction. The music we shouldn't notice, but it's always there. I hope you enjoy hearing from him about what it was like to work with Disney so closely on this attraction. So let's get to it. Let's go talk to Paul Leonard Morgan. All right. Well, my guest today is Paul Leonard Morgan, who is a BAFTA award-winning composer that's created many scores for films and TV shows like Dread and Limitless. Plus, he also worked on the score for the current version of Test Track at Epcot and a lot more. Paul, thanks so much for joining me here on the podcast. You are very welcome. Although it should have been the other way around. I've got this composer, Paul, who did Test Track, who also did Dread and Limitless. (laughs) Test Track is the most important thing. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, for listeners, it might be, but I definitely I don't want to undersell what you've done. So, um, <laughs> you know, so before we get into any of that, um, let's talk a little about your background. Going my, back to when you were younger, how did you get interested just in doing music? Uh, Mom is a music teacher. So she always tried to put me off doing music. She's like, there's no money in it. It's not a job. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I, I started playing piano when I was about four I guess and then recorder and different instruments and everyone always laughs at the recorder bit I was like no I did a diploma on recorder I know everyone else can play twinkle twinkle little star and then I studied at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music 
and started film music up there in Glasgow. When I was there, I just started working with a lot of bands, basically. There's, Glasgow had this really thriving music scene. So, and there was one studio called Savas Studios. So we were all just kind of based out of there, really. And all these bands were there, and then they would need string arrangements on their tracks. And they were like, Paul, he's a classical dude. And they're like, well, I am classical, but I also do <laughs> drums and everything else. But yeah, I, I work with my 100-piece orchestras. So I would start doing strings and brass arrangements, orchestral arrangements for their um, tracks. And then from there, some of them started asking me to produce their albums and, yeah, just did, did some remixes. And it really just kind of took off from there. I started doing some film stuff because they like the fact that I work with bands. And directors have always liked that, that whole kind of crossover thing. And then the bands like the fact that you do film stuff because it makes their stuff sound filmy. So it's everything in life has a knock-on effect, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's interesting to hear because personally I'm a big fan of Bell and Sebastian, who I know were around at that point in Glasgow. Yep. How much did you work with them during that time? So I did one arrangement for Bell and Sebastian. They do, they're a fantastic band and they just mostly do their, their stuff themselves. And they have Mick Cook, who's their trumpet player, who does most of their arranging. But I helped out on one of their, it wasn't the Peel Sessions, I can't remember which one it was, but I helped out on one of those. But then Isabel Campbell left, I mean, again, yeah, we've gone great. Yeah. Uh, but Isabel Campbell left Bell and Sebastian to do her own stuff. And so I worked on all of Isabel's albums, um, like with Mark Lanigan. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was really great. She would just, we would go and she would say, look, I want it to sound like an old Curtis Mayfield arrangement, or I want it to sound like this. Or for her, it was, it was mostly Nancy Sinatra arrangements, actually. She was obsessed in a good way, as, as you should be. So we would just go off and study the arrangements of that. And then... We went down to London, and which was just fantastic because she would focus on which studios every arrangement of the various tracks had been recorded in, and then we'd go to the various studios and just go and record them with the same kind of lineup. We would record them all at the same time. You know how a lot of the time you would record instruments separately, so mm-hmm. you've got isolation in the mix. So you do the strings first, and then the brass in separate sections, and so on. But in the '60s, it was a case of chuck everyone in the room, and you get that whole weird bleed. So you'd have the strings turning up and the horns microphone and the horns turning up in the wind microphone and so on and so that's how we would rec- record all of her stuff really and you know, it, it was a lot of experimentation but wow you know to get to do that with a full orchestra um and she's a very dear friend and yeah so, so it kind of went from working with bell and seb to then working with isabel working on all of isabel's stuff did a remix for snow patrol uh, yeah they were all everyone kind of knew each other because as i say there was just this one studio so it's not a case of name dropping it's just a case of everyone hung out in the same bar together <laughs> over the road <laughs> studio uh and everyone got on and you know richard colburn who was the drummer from Don sebastian he would go off on tour with snow patrol and go and play percussion with them yeah it was just a case of camaraderie i guess well cool yeah and i i really like the way that mark lanigan and isabella's voices really come together it's it's fantastic so how did you how did you go from that to kind of really working more in the entertainment field and like for movies and tv and everything that was always fun. At the same time, I was doing, as I say, some directors asked me to do some short films for them, particularly this one guy, David McKenzie. He had heard the remix that I did in Snow Patrol, which is weird because it was, I think, about two people in the world had heard it. And he was like, oh, well, I love that. I love this is before they became huge. Yeah. And then I got a TV thing. And at the same time as I got a TV series, the first short film that I'd done picked up a BAFTA, the best soundtrack. And then the TV series got nominated for an Ivan Novello and BAFTAs and all that kind of stuff. And that just, that definitely helped. So then I was doing quite a lot of UK work, a series called Spooks, and Silent Witness and stuff. And then I was over here, sorry, here being LA, doing some work. And then I got a call about this film, Limitless. So that happened. It was a great and fun project. It was over Christmas, ooh, 2010, I think it was. Uh, Limitless went to number one around the world and then... It all kind of kicked off from there, really. That was my first big feature. And then it all just got a bit insane. I started working on Dread and working with dinosaurs and worked on some minion stuff. And I don't know. It's, it's, it's just weird the way that... It felt. So then I didn't have enough time to do any bands because then I was working all on film stuff. And then I started working on some games because the game stuff like the film stuff. And yeah, it's, it's great fun. I just like doing different stuff. And then the Disney thing, um, Test Track which was the first Disney thing I'd done. They would work on Test Track and had heard some of my Limitless soundtrack. You know, people use stuff as temp, temp music. So they'll lay in some of your music as temp to find out whether it works or not. And it doesn't mean you can't do a different style, but it's a lot easier for them in an edit suite. Just for everyone to sit around going, does that kind of thing work on our project? Does that kind of thing, can we imagine that as 
you know, our ride or our film or whatever. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that works quite well. So it gives you a starting point, I guess, for a discussion. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting that because I, you know, coming at it from mostly a visitor's perspective to like a theme park, like with Test Track, to see that side of it and how they really comes together is, is really interesting to me. So Test Track, you know, was a ride that originally had a different soundtrack. They redid it when you became involved, like in the like 2012, I think is when it was reopened. So did you when they brought you in, were you basically feel like you were starting from scratch or did you have any look back at what was done before on the earlier version? I still haven't heard the music from Test Track 1. Not a poo poo or anything else. I find it incredibly hard to listen to original music and then get that out of your head. So it was much more a case of, you know, they, they said, look, this is a really iconic ride. I knew about Test Track anyway. I've never been to Epcot Center, but I knew about it. So they just started filling me in and kind of, this is what it's about. And they showed me some visuals of it and they showed you a kind of rough movie of what it's going to be like in the various parts of the ride. And obviously it's not a high quality render, but it's just to give you enough of an idea. But the most important thing for me was seeing some of what they call a mood board, which is some of the visuals. And it, yeah, it, it then really helps just to kind of give you a vibe for it. And then I just went away and started writing a suite, which is what I do in films quite a lot, is before you actually write individual tracks, you go off and write, I don't know, a five minute, six minute suite with lots of arcs and dynamics and ups and downs to give them an idea of some of the thematic material which you'll use on it. And I think one of the things... The first thing is that Todd, who is the one of the musical directors on it, he, t- he took me down, music supervisors. He took me to Disneyland in L.A. It was the day, it was the day that the Cars ride opened. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, I remember this so clearly because I said, well, look, you know, I'm struggling to imagine, again, I've always loved Disney but never really done any of the parts coming from Glasgow in Scotland. <laughs> they, didn't, they haven't really opened up other than Paris which I've been to, but it's a kind of different experience. So he took me, and we basically went on as many rides as we possibly could that day to show me the whole experience of how music works, you know, as you're going in, as you're in the line, uh, the purpose of music, and how it works with different speakers. So there's quite a technical aspect to it as well. And I remember it was 110 degrees, and there were people waiting in line for the Cars ride for two and a half hours. And I remember Todd just basically getting me to the front of the line because we're trying to go on as many rides during the day as we could for you know, it for the experience and to learn about it. I felt awful. All these people in the line, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Don't hate me. This is great. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that was, that was kind of how that was the first steps was really just going around and studying how music works in a Disney park. And it's the Imagineers are just, they are phenomenal people. Their minds are insane. And I think the wonderful thing about them is that all of this stuff just works. And unless you actually know the reason why different pieces of music are playing in different parts of the park, it should just work without you realizing about it. Yeah, it's like music in a film. You shouldn't be aware of it necessarily. And suddenly it's like, oh, wow, this is really helping my emotional journey. So, yeah, they're really clever dudes. Yeah, and that that's really interesting. So you were, And it's interesting because that Cars ride is actually... The ride system is very similar to Test Track. It's not the same ride at all, but I don't know how much that helped. So after you did that, did that help with figuring out what was so different about a theme park? Because how, how, as you dug into it further, what were some of the big differences you noticed in how you would write music for that versus writing for Dread or Limitless or something like that? Okay. So the main difference is that it's what's called nonlinear. So if you stick on a CD or you download something from iTunes or whatever else, you're listening to your track from naught seconds in. So, you know, you're listening to the track in its entirety, or if you listen to it on the radio, yeah? If you go into Test Track or any of the rides, you don't know, or me as a composer, I don't know at what stage those people are going to come in because the music's playing the entire time. It's on a loop. So there's never a beginning and there's never an ending, really, in the sense that they might walk in at one minute, 32 on the track someone else walks in at 50 seconds on the track someone else walks in at two minutes on the track so everyone's got to have the same experience but it's not like you're just going in listening to the track starting from one so most of them are kind of three and a half minute tracks on loop and we have what's called a null point loop which means that there can be absolutely no click on it if you were to look at a waveform on a computer it's all got to be they have to match exactly at that end so that By the time that they loop, they just loop over and over and over and over and over, and you never hear any clicks. You're not aware of that loop. 
But it, this is then the tricky thing with something like Test Track. Because if you picture yourself going around on that line, there are tons of different parts while you're on that line. You go through different rooms. So there's actually about eight different tracks playing at the same time. And if you have eight different tracks playing, then you obviously have this huge cacophony of sound. You know, it just sounds like, oh, my God, what is this? It's a headache. If you have them playing, you know, there's a speaker in room one, there's a speaker in room two, there's a speaker in room three, and they're all playing different music. It's going to absolutely do you in. So it was a huge challenge because basically what you're doing is, right, I walked into the room of test tracks. So the first track that you hear when you see the car when you go in, that's the kind of big announcement track. So that's a nice big track. That's all cool. You then walk along a little bit and then you're into room two, even though it's the same room, there's kind of little dividers. So room two has got to work in tandem with room one if I'm playing that piece of music at the same time. But it can't. So it's got to have the same kind of chord structure, but it needs to be different enough from room one that you realize subliminally that you're then in the next room. So that might be a stripped down version. It might have, for example, instead of brass and drums and strings playing, it might have little pizzicato strings going dum, bum, 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 bum. Bomb. and then you go through there into room three and suddenly the pizzicato strings might have a solo cello playing with it so it evolves as you go around that entire place but the point of it is that hopefully the audience don't notice it's supposed to be a subliminal a subliminal i use that word because you don't want people to notice the joining parts so as you go through it's like hearing all these different elements of a track so that by the time you get to the end of a line after well, it depends. 45 minutes could be an hour 45. What you don't want is people just getting incredibly bored with a three and a half minute track on loop. So all of these different elements have got to have enough interest that it sounds it's taking you on an immersive journey, really. So it's actually pretty tricky. It sounds, oh, great, it's just stick on a piece of music. But the thought process behind it of all the different speakers and all the different parts of the rooms playing different elements, which you've written. So all the tracks have got to have the same BPM. All the tracks have got to be in the same key and they can't really vary from you know, the key changes because otherwise the speakers in room one are going to sound different from the speakers in room five, which is going to sound weird. But it's you know, you're listening to that same track for an hour 45. You're going to be bored out of your skull unless there's enough the motion going on with it so um yeah is it god i sound so boring and geeky don't i <laughs> but no, it's, it's it, great <laughs> it, is it is it is one of those things that if it works it should just work and you're not aware of it but if it doesn't work it just it sounds weird and i remember going to disney in january this year with my kids and i was passing do you know the carousel at disneyland yeah yeah so the carousel's on the left, and I think it's Toad of Toad Hall or something on the right-hand side. And you have, basically, you, I noticed it, again, really, only because I'm now geeky about this kind of stuff. I had the carousel music on the left, and then on the speak, as I'm walking down the middle between the carousel and the right on the right, and the right on the right had a kind of acoustic version of this, the same music on the carousel, but it was different. And then there was another speaker, I was like, this is like doing test track. And I'm suddenly yeah. going around the whole of Disney going... Oh, that's how they did that. And I phoned up John, uh, the head of music at Disney, and just said, dude, that is an incredible job because I really hadn't noticed it at all. And suddenly it's like, wow, this... Because again, if you picture it, all the different music in the park is going at different BPMs. It's going to sound weird. It's going to give you a headache if you're going down it all at different times. No, that's really interesting because I've been to some parks, you know, local parks or regional or whatnot, where you get stuck in a line with a loop that goes over and over, or there's one where you're listening to music for a ride, and then they have like some dance music playing too close, oh, and it's oh, just oh, this six flags, yeah, Which six flags, so exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Here where I live, and or they're having somebody on a megaphone yelling at you to come do a carnival game, whatever. <laughs> and so your point is really good because, like, going through test track you do have that sense of moving forward and the line is usually very long, but yeah, it's rare at Disney park, especially with some of the more modern attractions to have that experience. So I, th I totally get what you're saying because it's tricky. I mean, the show building for test track is gigantic. So yeah. were you, you mentioned you went to Disneyland and you hadn't been there. Were you able to go before it opened and go to Epcot and actually experience how your music would sound in there with the imagineers oh yeah and again one of the things absolute kudos to these guys is they the disney guys are so they value music so much as you should with their rich heritage but they value it so much that 
basically anything you want within reason, you know, they will help you achieve. And one of the things they say was, look, so, so we started off like that. So we wrote the music and we spoke about it and they said, well, look, part of the test track stuff is yes. So you've got, there, there are different parts of it, but part of it is the line itself. Part of it is the music, like what we call the announcement music, which is blasting out of the speakers outside to, to you know, when you hear it as you're walking past going, oh, that's test track. So that cannot be a three and a half minute track because that on loop all day would drive anybody insane. What Todd and John had said was, look, they said, look, imagine it as a band. It's a kind of slightly futuristic band because it's a futuristic ride. But that band is then going to play all of the tracks. So it's like making a CD played by this band, which is going to be coming out of the speakers at the front. So when you think of it like that, it's like, well, what futuristic instruments would you have? You know, what this, what that, what sounds on a synthesizer would you have playing with this? So it was a, it was a mixture of orchestra and synths and, you know, and drums. And I think I wrote five tracks in total. Each of the tracks were about five or six minutes. So you've got a total of about 30, 35 minutes on loop on those ones. But having done that, they then have to balance out Stephen and these various audio guys have to work out how it's going to sound in the park. So this is my first ever experience. I mean, imagine you're a huge Disney fan like I am. And you've never been to the Epcot Center. And they flew me over and I got off the plane and I was working like a madman on this film. And I remember, I was so tired, got off the plane. Now, what was it? I was in LA for this game session. I've flown back to Glasgow to go and see my wife and kids. Flew back to London because I was doing some theatre and then flew straight from there to Orlando. They got a car for me from Orlando, took me straight to the park. And it was 10 o'clock at night. And the park's just shutting up. Yeah, you've got the firework display going on. But And the first thing I hear as I get out of the car in the Epcot Centre is my music blasting out of the speakers. <laughs> the, oh, wow. first thing, the first thing I've ever experienced in the Epcot Centre. I'm just like, hey, this is cool. So, so they were trying that out. But, of course, the ride wasn't finished yet. The track was in place. But they were still doing all of the, obviously, the track's the first thing that gets laid. And then after that, they're building the structure around it. And we had to mix it. So what happens is I'm sat, and again, bear in mind, I've never done this before. So this is the coolest thing out, like a kid in a candy store. So I'm sat on one of the cars. I'm wearing a hard hat. John, uh, the head of music, is sat next to me wearing a hard hat. Todd is there, and the mixer is there. So the mixer has her Pro Tools set up on a laptop. And she's going, so the ride goes, and I'm going, yeah. No, you need to put, yeah, they've got lots and lots of speakers on this ride. Some of, you know, some of the rides have the speakers actually on the carriage, the carriage itself. Others just have tons of speakers along the ride. So one of the elements you notice on test track is you kind of wait there and then it zo- takes you up right to the beginning of just before the car zooms off. So you have this little five second sting. So you get on that and I'm going, yeah, well, as you come through this bit, or this bit, it feels like the music should have a crescendo. So it gets louder. Obviously, with an orchestra, you have a crescendo. Well, how do you achieve that when the car's traveling at pace or you're going up a ramp? So they do this incredible programming where the different speakers play louder depending on where you are. So we try that. But what happens is at the end of the ride, we all get off the ride. She takes her laptop. She plugs it with a USB cable into the front bonnet of the carriage of this of this carriage, uploads the mix. And then we all get back on and then we do the ride again. So, you know, test track goes up to 70 miles an hour, whatever else. Yeah. I'm shorts and T-shirt because, you know, I just come through. I was thinking, oh, this will be fine. It'll be Orlando. Of course, by this time, it's 11 o'clock in the evening. And then we get off and we do it again. Right. This bit needs done. This bit needs done. Two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and you know, and I think I've never seen anyone mix wirelessly before. Yeah, so literally it's from the laptop and they're doing it and it's uploading it to somewhere else. And I go, I'm freezing cold because there's no... Yeah, there's there's nothing there's no what you call it building it's just literally <laughs> that ride so we were doing that ride for about three and a half hours and i'm in shorts and t-shirts at two in the morning it's like i, I need to go to bed now <laughs> but i mean what an incredible because obviously you need to do that while there's no one else in the park so we did it that and then went to bed and then the next day did exactly the same thing it took 10 to 10 p.m and then we started doing some more mixing and then, obviously, you then go into the after-show stuff. So when you come off the ride, and then there's tons of music playing. So the same kind of thing. You just go around and listen to the levels of the speakers, and does it need a bit more bass, or does it need a bit more this? So it's completely different from, if you picture a film, when you're dubbing a film, you go into a, a, a dub suite. I mean, it's basically like sitting in a theatre, and you just mix it in a theatre, and you listen to how it sounds. Well, how the heck do you do that in an open space like Test Track when there's 
400 speakers around the place so wow. that wow. is your dub suite the dub suite is the ride so you're just sitting there so yeah it was, it was absolutely incredible experience well excellent that that sounds amazing <laughs> because that's the best job out it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> i i really you have a very hard job now i know i know it's a lot of work especially like you said you're traveling around the country i'm sure there's a point at like 2 a.m where you're like where am i what am i doing <laughs> yeah completely but honestly i mean i will never forget that you know, the whole the first piece of music i ever hear in epcot is my music blasting out of disneyland out of disney world you know and yeah it just i mean no one ever knows that stuff behind the scenes if what's you're on a, you're wearing a hard hat because the ride isn't finished <laughs> it's two in the morning and you've been doing this same roller coaster for four hours <laughs> so it's, it's just as well i don't get stuck on coasters but it was amazing and uh, the interesting part of this is that i did a game a video game called battlefield hardline about six months later and they had really liked my dread soundtrack but the thing that prepared me the most for writing music for games was at this ride because games work in a very similar way which is that you have different elements playing at different times it's kind of worked in layers and it's non-linear because again if you work on a game picture it you're never pl- playing at exactly the same time as say someone on the other side of the country so this this kind of loop based music but never quite knowing where the loop starts and the different layers that come on and i said to the guy this is so funny this is some violent shoot them up you know and it, <laughs> i was like yeah but but it's but you know, my experience was from an Epcot Center ride. So it's, yeah, it's weird how one job has an effect on something else. Exactly. Yeah. And so I believe you also worked on a project for Dis- with Disney in Shanghai in some form. Could you could you talk about that? Uh, the after show stuff. So we call it the after show, as in after the ride. Yeah. Um, on Tron. Yeah. So yeah, J- Joe Trapanese and Daft Punk had done the main ride. Phenomenal. Absolutely great job. Again, you know, I just remember seeing the actual visuals of this just going, and the, before it's built. Just going, this is awesome. I want to be on that motorbike. And again, they go at serious speeds. Yeah. So again, the brief for that was pretty much, well, look, this is going to be after show. So you've come off the ride, you're going around all the different rooms. So it's got to be in that kind of Tron land. There are some of the big screens in the background. You're playing some of the games afterwards as, as you're hanging around. There's all the music for that. And then there's a kind of two-minute showpiece that comes up every, I think, 20 minutes. So that's something the whole room goes dark and this music blasts out. So it's really good fun because that was very different from Test Track in the sense that it had to be quite tronic. So, you know, it's do 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 You've got your staccato strings. You've got your big bombs underneath it. You've got your drums going with it. And it's, again, very futuristic. So it was really good fun to do. And then similarly, there was about a 40-minute suite where we used the original Tron music and tied that together with some original music that I wrote. So it's not just Tron. It's not just stuff that I wrote, but stuff in between it. And it's again, it sounds like a nice, fluid 40-minute suite, which then loops at the end of 40 minutes without you hearing a loop point. Again, very, very different, but it's the same feel as far as the technical aspect if you come off the ride you're still immersed in what's going on you don't want to blow people with massively loud music because the main point of the ride is the ride itself but you're still trying to create an immersive experience so that people are still enjoying the ride and still being there they've queued for however long they've lined up so they they want to have another 10 minutes there just to enjoy being there before they go off. So yeah, it was great. You know, you get to work with some Tron material. I mean, it's absolutely legendary and iconic, isn't it? Oh yeah, and um, it's interesting because Test Track people often talk about the newer version as feeling a little bit like Tron at times. I mean, you know, just because it's more futuristic and you're on a car, but it has that kind of similar feel. So it's interesting that they had to work. Someone did a mashup as well, didn't they? Where they did a podcast. So they, oh, not a podcast, but some, something of a pod where, where they, um, they'd done music for the, I love, I love the fans. They're amazing. They'd done, like, they'd taken the Tron music and fit it to the exact duration of the ride so that when the ride takes off, yeah. Yeah. you're supposed to press play on this and it should last the duration of the ride. So you're listening to the Tron music for the duration of the ride, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you but, could put on headphones, right, and just ride yeah, right through. I, I think that was the idea, but I mean, honestly, I love it. I mean, the feedback, again, I love it when you work on projects where the fans are so passionate because the feedback that I got, I think I had one person complain that it wasn't like Test Track 1, and again, fair enough, but I have no idea and it wasn't supposed to be. But overwhelmingly, they all got in touch and said, 
this is one of the best parts of Epcot. The ride's fantastic, and the music really enhances it, brings it up to date. We absolutely adore it. And, yeah, I forward them on to the Disney guys sometimes just to say, this actually makes me feel proud because now I've got kids. And I have relations that go to Epcot Centre and say, hey, we went to the Tron ride. Uh, we went to uh, the Test Track ride and heard your stuff. But it makes me feel cool knowing that doing a film is awesome and you see it up on screen and it's a good buzz and you work very hard on it and it's great. But there's something about the longevity of Disney stuff where, I don't know, is it is that heritage. You Once you've got your piece there, you know it's going to be there for at least 10 years. So it's, it's not many people when you're starting out kind of go, oh, I'll have a piece of music at at Epcot, at Disney World, at Disneyland, or you get to work on a Minions short film or whatever. These are things which have longevity, which you can show your kids in years to come and go, yeah, I, I worked on that. It's, it's, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Oh, it's, it's great. And I think with Test Track, I don't get the sense they're going to be changing that anytime soon. It, it's pretty timeless in terms of being futuristic. It does, it's not going to seem dated in five years or something, and the music is that way too. I don't think so. I mean, the, the blue is funny. The blue lighting that they have on that um, as you go down. I remember looking at it at the time going, oh, I'd like that in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I will give it, give it, they were like, give it 10 years. It should be, you know, it should be kind of in you know, everybody's mainstream by then with the LED thing. But no, I think, yeah, they did such an incredible job on the style, on the art direction. Uh, the ride producer, Trevor, you know, he was incredibly supportive. And you know, it's, sometimes it takes a while to get on a client's wavelength when you're writing to find out what it is so if you work with the director of a film or you work with the creative director of a ride you to try and work out what it is that is their vision for this and there's something incredibly satisfying when you really get it and as a team you look at it at the end and go yeah this is great and the feedback's great and everybody just loved the ride and the fact that people would want to obviously hopefully they don't have to line up for an hour and a half but even if they do the fact that people want to give it that much time because they know that the experience that they're going to get is not just about the ride itself but it's about the pre-ride it's about the pre-show and the after show it's about that whole experience of being there it is that immersive experience so it's not just your two minute ride but it is having a look at all of the stuff beforehand and all of the stuff after so yeah well, great. Yeah, my daughter's, I have two daughters, but my older daughter's nine. And the last trip we took, I asked her, what's the thing she's her favorite? Like, what does she want to do the most? And it was Test Track. So um, it's doing <laughs> something right. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. It's true. It's a true story. But so would you consider, I mean, if I obviously you probably would, but would you consider doing another theme park attraction down the road if it came, oh, if yeah. it arose? Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the people. And for me, I get offered quite a lot of work. You know, it's, <laughs> there's at least so many hours in the day, so you've really got to work out what jobs you actually want to do. And one of the things that you look at when you're looking at a project, so if I'm going to be working on a project for a year, or if I'm going to be working on a project for a month, or if I'm going to be working on a project for a week, it, it varies. But most projects for films are like a couple of months. A Disney project would be a couple of months. You kind of go, well, I'm going to be working really hard on this. A, it's got to creatively float my boat, so it's got to be something that I'm really going to be able to put myself into. And that's going to give me a lot of satisfaction being able to write for that. So it's not just, oh, I just want it to sound like this or, oh, I just want it to sound like this. But it's like, hey, what would you bring to this job? But the other incredibly important part is the people. And it really is. The Imagineers are just, oh, what a bunch of guys. And I love them. And, yeah, we're, we're all dear friends now after this. But they are incredible people. They're so supportive. And, again, you know, it's just such a rarity that you get to work with people that value music as much as Disney. And, it, and that really does count for something as an artist when someone says, what can we do to help you bring your vision to life? And you give them not a list, but it's like, well, I would really like this many players and I would really like this. And this would be really helpful if we could do this. And they're just like, right, yeah, go for it. This is going to be in the park for however long we, we want to make sure that it sounds right. Well, excellent. Well, this is this has been great to talk to you about this, and um, I really appreciate it. So, um, if listeners want to learn more about, it, I know you have so many projects you've worked on. We've barely even mentioned most of them. Where <laughs> is there a good place online for them to go to kind of catch up with what? You're yeah, doing? go find my Facebook page. They don't, I don't think they want your data. Just go. To <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, remember what it is. It's like Facebook slash Paul Leonard Morgan. I think there's only one Paul Leonard Morgan around. So go 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 Google it. It'll be in there. Okay, great. And I'll I'll post the links on the, the show notes and on the blog page so everybody can find it. Well, Paul, um, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for doing it. 
You are most welcome. I'd like to give a special thanks to Paul for taking the time out of what I know is a very busy schedule to speak with me here on the podcast. And also thanks to Fritz at St. Rose Management for helping to set up this interview, which was a real treat to do. If you enjoyed this interview, I definitely suggest that you go back and listen to episode 33 of the Tomorrow Society podcast, where I spoke with composer Bruce Broughton about his work scoring for attractions like Ellen's Energy Adventure, The Making of Me, and the current version of Soren. Now, I have a mission for you. If you have any recommendations or suggestions for the type of guest or even specific names that you would love for me to talk to, it would be cool to hear from you. You can email me, dan at tomorrowsociety.com, or drop me a line on Twitter at TomorrowSOC or Facebook at Tomorrow Society. Part of the fun of doing this podcast is getting the chance to interact with you, so I would love to speak with guests that you enjoy hearing from. And of course, if you'd love to send me a review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast provider, that would always be appreciated. The Tomorrow Society podcast is hosted, produced, and edited by Dan Heaton. The music is composed by Adam Hookie and performed by the Sophisticated Babies. You can learn more about Adam's music at adamhucke.com. Thanks again for all the support for this show, and I will be back talking with you again very soon.